Hello, YouTube world. This is DJ Swoo straight out of Johannesburg, South Africa, and welcome to the Hustlers Corner um, book reading sessions. We are still on Steve Biko's I Write What I Like. We're about to get into chapter 10. Like, share, subscribe. Let everybody else know about the Hustlers Corner movement. Be a part of the movement as well. I appreciate you guys tuning in in case you bumped into this video by accident. Don't forget to click that like button. Click, click, click. Let's go. Chapter number 10. All the other videos, chapter 9, chapter 8, all the way down to 1. Check out all those videos if you haven't had a chance to um, read the Steve Biko's I Write What I Like. This is strictly for educational purposes. All right, let's go. Chapter 10. The church has seen by a young layman. This paper was given at a conference of black ministers of religion organized by black community programs and held at the Ecumenical Lay Training Center, Edenvale, Natal, in May 1972. Ministers of religion have an importance in black society, which a secularized West Westerner will find hard to understand. At the same time, the pressures on them to conform to the status quo are formidable. Ben Kwaba, executive director of BCP, and Steve, Steve Biko, realized the importance of trying to conscientize this key section of the black community, the church. A small measure of the change in the traditionally conservative attitudes of black ministers of religion is the fact that five of the old students of St. Peter's, open bracket, Anglican, close bracket, theological college have been or are currently banned or detained. This would have been unimaginable 10 years ago. The church is seen by a young layman. I am aware that today I am addressing myself to a group of people with whom I differ in two respects. Firstly, I am a layman talking to a group of religious ministers. Secondly, I am a young man talking to a fairly elderly people. There are perhaps the two aspects that brought me here. An attempt to close the generation gap is always fundamental in the re-examination of any high theater of orthodox situation, which seems to be fast becoming obsolete in the minds of young people. Also important is the need to make common the concept of religion, especially Christianity, understanding of which is fast becoming the monopoly of so-called theologians. For this reason, I'm going to deal with the topic in a lay fashion. To my mind, religion can be defined as an attempt by a man to relate to a supreme being or force to which he ascribes all creation. Our particular model at this moment is Christianity. It is not quite clear just how important it is for the various religions that exist in this world to be uniform. One thing is certain, though, that all religions have got similar characteristics. Number one, they form man's moral conscience. In other words, embodied within each religion is a self of moral stipulations that govern the spiritual well-being of a particular people within a given context. Number two, they all attempt to explain the origin and destiny of man. All are agreed that man in the human form is a transient being in the world. All agree about man's origin as being from some force, the precise nature of which is defined differently. Where religions tend to differ is in the enunciation of the destiny of man. Number three, all religions claim or almost claim a monopoly on truth about the nature of the supreme being and about the way to identify with its... Oh, come again. Number three, all religions claim or almost claim a monopoly on truth about the nature of the supreme being and about the way to identify with his original intention about man. Full stop. Each religion is highly ritualistic. Through years of practice, the religion develops a certain pattern and procedure that in later years becomes inseparable from the central message of that religion. If one takes religion as nothing else but what it is, 
that is a social institution attempting to explain what cannot be scientifically known about the origin and destiny of man. Then from beginning, we can see the necessity of religion. All societies and indeed all individuals, ancient or modern, young or old, identify themselves with a particular religion. And when none is existent, they develop one. They, they develop one, yeah. In most cases, religion is intricately intertwined with the rest of cultural traits of society. In a sense, this makes the religion part and parcel of the behavioral pattern of that society and makes the people bound by the limits of that religion through a strong identification with it. Where people are subjected to a religion that is removed from their cultural makeup, then elements of disgruntlement begin to be noted and sometimes open defiance is soon displayed. Hence, one can make the claim that most religions are specific and where they fail to observe the requirement of specificity, then they must be sufficiently adaptable to convey relevant messages to different people in different situations. For indeed, each religion has a message for the people amongst with whom... Okay, I'll come again. For indeed, each religion has a message for the people amongst whom it is operative. These are perhaps some of the things that never were uppermost in the, in the minds of the people who brought Christianity into South Africa. Whereas Christianity had gone through rigorous cultural adaptation from ancient Judea, through Rome, through London, through Brussels and Lisbon, Somehow, when it landed in the Cape, it was made to look fairly rigid. Christianity was made the central point of a culture, which brought with it new styles of clothing, new customs, new forms of etiquette, new medical approaches, and perhaps new armaments. The people amongst whom Christianity was spread had to cast away their indigenous clothing, their customs, their beliefs, which were all described as being... Uh, okay, come again. The people amongst whom Christianity was spread had to cast away their indigenous clothing, their customs, their beliefs, which were all described as being pagan and barbaric. Usage of the spear became a hallmark of savagery. All too soon, the people were divided into two camps. The converted, open bracket, amakobok, amakobok, amakobok. No, there's a PH there. It's bo. So it's amakobok, close bracket. And the pagans, amakaba. Mm. Come again. Usage of the spear became a hallmark of savagery. All too soon, the people were divided into two camps. The converted, Amakoboka. No, Amakoboka. I don't know even what they were trying to write. Nesizu. No, Amakoboka. Let me say in a Bantu language. And the pagans, Amakaba. The difference in clothing between these two groups made what otherwise could have been merely a religious difference actually become at times internecine warfare striped of the core of their being and estranged from each other because of their differences the african people became a playground for colonialists it has always been the pattern throughout history that whatsoever brings the new order knows knows it best and is therefore the perpetual teacher of those to whom the new order is being brought if the white missionaries were right about their God in the eyes of the people, then the African people could only accept whatever these new know-all tutors had to say about life. The acceptance of the colonialist tainted version of Christianity marked the turning point in the resistance of African people. The church and its operation in modern day South Africa has therefore to be looked at in terms of the way it was introduced in this country. 
Even at this stage, one notes the appalling irrelevance of the interpretation given to the scriptures. In a country teeming with injustice and fanatically committed to the practice of oppression, intolerance, and blatant cruelty because of racial bigotry, in a country where all black people are made to feel the unwanted stepchildren of a God whose pretense they cannot feel, in a country where father and son, mother and daughter alike, develop daily into neurotics through sheer inability to relate the present to the future because of a completely engulfing sense of destitution. The church further adds to their insecurity by its inward directed definition of the concept of sin and its encouragement of the mere culpa attitude. Stern faced ministers stand on pulpits every Sunday to heap loads of blame on black people in townships for their thieving, house breaking, stabbing, murdering, adultery, etc. No one ever attempts to relate all these vices to poverty, unemployment, overcrowding, lack of schooling, and migratory labor. No one wants to completely condone abhor abhorrent behavior but in okay i'll come again sorry guys no one wants to completely condone abhorrent behavior but it frequently is necessary for us to analyze situations a little bit deeper than the surface suggests because the white minister because the white missionary described black people as thieves lazy sex hungry etc and because he equated all that was valuable with whiteness. Our churches, through our ministers, see all these vices I have mentioned above not as manifestations of the cruelty and injustice which we are subjected to by the white man, but inevitable proof that after all the white man was right when he described us as savages. Thus, if Christianity in its introduction was corrupted by the inclusion of aspects which made it the ideal religion for the colonization of people, nowadays, in its interpretation, it is the ideal religion for the maintenance of the subjugation of the same people. It must also be noted that the church in South Africa as everywhere else has been spoiled by bureaucracy. No more is it just only an expression of the sum of total of people's religious feelings. It has become, in fact, highly institutionalized, not as one unit, but as several powerful units, differing, perhaps not much on scriptural interpretation, as in institutional aims. It has become inconceivable to think of South Africa without a Roman Catholic Church or a Methodist Church or an Anglican Church, etc. In spite of the fact that average Methodist from the street hardly knows how he differs from an Anglican or Congregationalist, this bureaucracy and, institu and institutionalization tends to make the Church removed from important priorities and to concentrate on secondary and tertiary functions like structures and finance, etc. And because of this, the church has become very irrelevant and in fact, ivory tower, as some people refer to it. Going hand in hand with the bureau, okay? Going hand in hand, with the bureaucratization and institutionalization of the church is a special brand of a problem, which also makes the church extremely irrelevant. The concentration of that bureaucracy and institutionalization in the hands of white people. It is a known fact that barring the African churches, most of the churches have 70, 80, or 90% of their membership within the black world. It is also a known fact that most of the churches have 70, 80, or 90% of controlling power in white hands.
It is still a known fact that white people simply don't know black people and in most cases do not have the interests of black people at heart. Therefore, it can be reasonably concluded that either the black people's churches are governed by a small non-sympathetic foreign minority or that too, or, okay. Therefore, in, it can be reasonably concluded that either the black people's churches are governed by a small non-sympathetic foreign minority or that too many black people are patronizing for or that too many black people are patronizing foreign churches which of these two it is is not quite clear but let us assume that it is the former since the majority of the people in this country are black people in that case, therefore, black people who are Christians are not only conniving at the hitherto he, he irrelevant nature of Christianity as spelled out by the churches, but they also allow a non-sympathetic minority which is not interested in making Christianity relevant to people remain in control of the workings of the churches. This is an untenable situation which is oh i'll come again this is untenable situation which if allowed to continue much longer will deplete from the already thinning crowds that go to church on a sunday then too the tendency by christians to make interpretation of religion a specialist job results in a general apathy in a world which is fast departing from identification with mystic mysticism mysticism young people nowadays like to feel that they can interpret christianity and extract from it messages relevant to them and their situation without being stopped by orthodox limitations this is why the catholic church with its dozens of dogmas either has to just or this is why the catholic church with its dozens of dogmas either has to adjust fast to a changing world or risk the chance of losing their young constituency in various aspects this applies to all churches in the christian world before looking at suggested changes within the church let me then summarize what I regard as my major criticisms to it. Number one, it makes Christianity too much of a turn the other cheek religion whilst addressing itself to a destitute people. Number two, it is stunted with bureaucracy and institutionalization. Number three, it manifests in its structures a tacit acceptance of the system that is white equals value. Number four, it is limited by too much specialization. Full stop. The most important area to which we should perhaps direct ourselves is gaining the control that is rightfully ours within these churches. In order to do this, we must agree that in fact we have a common purpose, a common goal, a common problem. Equally, we should agree that through living in a privileged society and through being socialized in a corrupt system, our white Christian counterparts, though brothers in Christ, have not provoked, have not prov oh, I'll come again, sorry guys. Equally, we should agree that through living in a privileged society, and through being socialized in a corrupt system, our white Christian counterparts, though brothers in Christ, have not proved themselves brothers in South Africa. We must agree also that tacitly or overtly, deliberately or unawares, white Christians within the churches are preventing the church from assuming its natural character in the South African context and therefore preventing it from being relevant to the black man's situation. 
It has been said by many a black church man. Okay, let me come again. Sorry, guys. It has been said by many a black church man that whites are in power within the churches because the churches are modeled on Western lines, which white people know best. In order to be able, therefore, to change the churches, we have first to gain ascendance over them in that white model. Then thereafter, turn that model into one we cherish, we love, we understand, and one that is relevant to us. I can only point out here that it cannot be conceivable that all the white people in controlling positions within the church are elected by other white people. Obviously, some get into their positions because they caucus vote-wielding blacks to put them in those positions. It is high time that black people learn the highly tried method of caucusing to put other black people in control of churches in which black people have something at stake, such as, oh, let me come again. Such elected blacks will obviously have to function according to a mandate clearly outlined by the same black caucus that put them in power. The second area in which we must focus our attention is a thorough understanding of what many people have hitherto scorned, namely black theology. There is a truth in the statement that many black people, oh sorry, let me come again. There is a truth in the statement that many people can say one thing differently because they look at it from different angles. Christianity can never hope to remain abstract and removed from the people's environmental problems. In order to be appreciated, in order to be applicable to people, it must have meaning for them in their given situation. If they are an oppressed people, it must have something to say about their oppression. Black theology, therefore, is a situational interpretation of Christianity. It seeks to relate the present-day black man to God within the given context of the black man's suffering and his attempts to get out of it. It shifts the emphasis of man's moral obligations from avoiding wronging false authorities by not losing his reference book, not stealing food when hungry, and not cheating police when he is caught, to being committed to eradicating all cause for suffering as presented in the death of children from starvation, outbreaks of epidemics in poor areas, or existence of thuggery and vandalism in townships. In other words, it shifts the emphasis from petty sins to major sins in a society. Therefore, ceasing to teach the people to suffer peacefully. These are topics that black ministers of religion must begin to talk about seriously if they are to save Christianity from falling foul with black people, particularly young black people. The time has come for our own theolog theologians to take up the cudgels of the fight by restoring a meaning and direction in the black man's understanding of God. No nation can win a battle without faith. And if our faith in our God is spoiled by, by our having to see him through the eyes of the same people we are fighting against, then obviously begins to be something wrong in that relationship. Finally, I would like to remind the black ministry and indeed all black people that God is not in the habit of coming down from heaven to solve people's problems on earth. That was chapter 10 of Steve because I write what I like. Go check out all the other chapters. I've read them for you. And um, go subscribe and be a part of the Hustlers Corner movement. And while you're at it, subscribe to DJ Smooth TV. Thank you very much. Don't forget to click the like button.